Due Process, winner of 19 regional Emmy Awards, including the 2010 New York Emmy for our coverage of voting rights, and the 2011 Mid-Atlantic Emmy for Outstanding Discussion Series. Due Process is a presentation of Rutgers School of Law in Newark and the Edward J. Blaustein School of Planning and Public Policy. Studio facilities provided by the Rutgers ITV Studio, Division of Continuing Studies. Brown was supposed to end segregation in the uh, public schools, and it, it didn't end segregation at all, particularly in the urban areas in the north where there was concentration. He was at the heart of Brown v. Board, along with Thurgood Marshall, arguing and constructing the case that changed America. U.S. District Court Judge Robert Carter has died at 94, but with the help of friends Ted and Nina Wells, he's remembered by us and them, right here on Due Process. Major funding for Due Process provided by the New Jersey State Bar Foundation, committed to educating the public about the law, and by the Fund for New Jersey, supporting informed citizens for an effective democracy. He was among the greatest legal heroes you may never have heard of. But for those who know the history of civil rights law in America, Newark native Robert Carter earned his place among the men and women who did most to make America live up to its promise. I'm Raymond Brown. And I'm Sandra King. With Judge Carter's recent death at 94, we were reminded of his central role in the case that changed this country, Brown v. Board and reminded, too, of the rare opportunity five years ago to sit down in Judge Carter's home for an intimate conversation on his early life in Newark and East Orange, his own encounters with officially sanctioned bigotry, and the naming in his honor in 2006 of the Department of Education's Trenton headquarters, a symbol for all of New Jersey's children. When the State Department of Education named its building for Robert Carter. One of the best civil rights lawyers of our time. His name may not have been widely known, but the case he helped win may be America's most famous and perhaps its most important. I remind people that Robert L. Carter is as responsible as anyone, dead or alive, for Brown versus Board of Education. Brown v. Board, which put a legal end to separate but equal, brilliantly argued by the celebrated Thurgood Marshall and his less famous first assistant, Robert Carter, an architect of the struggle for civil rights and later a federal judge. Let us welcome the Honorable Robert Carter. But his childhood was spent in the streets and schools of Newark and East Orange. One of eight children raised in poverty by a widowed mother, the only one to go to college, Carter learned the love of books at the Newark Public Library. But it was the love of justice that would prove to be the overriding motivation for most of Carter's 90 years. I don't believe that I would be the Secretary of State had it not been for that landmark decision that the great Judge Robert L. Carter personally tried and personally argued before the United States Supreme Court. Attorney Nina Wells was then New Jersey Secretary of State, but she was also a close friend of Judge Carter, as was her husband Ted Wells, whose own legal career has made headlines for years, but never more than during his defense of Dick Cheney aide Scooter Libby. More importantly, Ted is also Chairman Emeritus of the NAACP's Legal Defense Fund. Nina and Ted are also good friends of ours, and welcome to Due Process. Nina, let me start with you. Our guests, our viewers just heard you say in 2006 that your role as Secretary of State wouldn't be possible but for Carter's work a half century earlier. 
since we're trying to put him in perspective, what did you mean by that? Raymond, I tell you, I am certain that I would not have been the Secretary of State had it not been for that decision. I wouldn't have gone to law school. My sister went to a segregated school in Washington, D.C. I have a sister who's a pediatrician and a brother who's an orthopedic surgeon. I just know the kind of education that she was getting at that time, it was definitely not equal to the education that my younger siblings and myself received. Uh, there's no way that uh, Governor Corzine would have known me, I believe, had it not been for the Brown decision and all of the amazing opportunities that I've had as a result of that and the great education that I've had. Um, the problem is, though, that I'm not sure that the current generation is benefiting as much as my uh, generation did with just a whole new class of individuals who are able to enjoy all of the benefits of the American dream. I'm not sure those doors aren't closing a little bit. Anyone who follows law knows the name Ted Wells. And I wonder what Judge Carter meant to you as an adult, as a successful lawyer. You run into all kinds of famous and important people, and yet I know that Judge Carter had a special place in your heart and your life. Well, a lot of people don't realize that Judge Carter actually tried the Brown versus Board of Education case in Topeka. He was the trial lawyer. He went out to Kansas. He tried it in the district court. Later, when that case was argued in the U.S. Supreme Court, there were five cases argued that day that related to school desegregation, and Brown was the first case. And Judge Carter personally argued the Brown case. Of the five LDF lawyers who argued those cases, Judge Carter argued first. Thurgood Marshall argued second. Thurgood Marshall argued the case out of South Carolina. So Judge Carter really has never gotten his due. I mean, he was just not uh, Thurgood Marshall's chief lieutenant. He really was one of the chief architects of the entire strategy to attack segregation in the United States. And Ted, you know, Carter's early life set the tone and the spirit for the work he would do years later, as demonstrated by an old East Orange memory he shared with me when we talked. You say in your book that East Orange prepared you for the struggles ahead. Well, because of the fact that uh, I had to fight. The New Jersey Supreme Court rule that uh, during the while I was in the school, that there could be no discrimination in terms of access to all the facilities by any child. The next day, the gym classes, the white boys disappeared. I disappeared with them. And that must have raised some eyebrows. Yeah. And they, you know, they threatened me and did a whole lot of stuff. And then they, they, the threats wouldn't work. And, then the gym teacher said he'd lose his job, and I said, I'm sorry, I'm entitled to use this, this, uh, this pool, and... You couldn't swim. No, I couldn't swim. <laughs> but you got in the pool. I got in the pool. And the white boys didn't get in the pool. No, the white boys didn't get in the pool. And I was uh, scared to death. Now, in private car conversation, Judge Carter was a pretty direct person, as he was in the interview with Sandy. Had you had occasion over the years to hear him talk about his experiences in East Orange? Absolutely. What was really interesting was that prior to going to East Orange, he went to Barringer High School and felt very empowered there, actually, because it was school for supposedly gifted students at that time. And he got to East Orange. That wasn't the case. But what was really interesting was that he read in the newspaper that courts had ruled yes. that he had the right to get in that pool. So, you know, I think Judge Carter, I was so excited about the building, the Department of Education being dedicated to him, something that the governor really wanted to do, because he is such a great role model. This is a guy who read the newspaper and knew his right and exercised his rights. He came from nothing. His father worked in a manufacturing plant. His father died when he was a year old. His mother was a domestic. So to say to all of the children of Newark and East Orange and around this country, you come from nothing, you can still be a, a phenomenal lawyer and a judge who argued 22 cases before the United States Supreme Court and lost one. So I think it is really a story of empowerment. And, and I, as uh, my husband, was, as Ted was saying a moment ago, people did not know about that. So for the kids of East Orange and Newark if, who are despairing every single day because of their circumstances, there is no reason for them to despair. They really, really have every opportunity to really succeed if we have the support 
of all of our society, our teachers, and our community needs to really come together Ted, to ensure that that happens. I'm, I'm sorry, Nana. Ted, how did Judge Carter's um, reputation stay so under the radar for the general public? He was not only the person who argued in Topeka, but he was the guy who was the architect. And as he says in his book, so much of what Thurgood said and wrote was actually his. And yet, we all know Thurgood Marshall, and most people don't know Robert Carter. Well, Thurgood Marshall is one of my heroes, as is Bob Carter. But Thurgood Marshall was the face of the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. He was the big personality. Did he just have the look and the personality, whereas Judge Carter was a... Ju Judge Carter... Um, was a much more quiet, uh, back person, room uh, type individual. If you were at a cocktail party, Judge uh, Thurgood Marshall probably would fill the room, whereas Judge Carter might be off in a corner. Uh, and this is what I think. I, of course, was not there at any such cocktail party. But, but their personalities were very different at the same time. Judge Carter was brilliant. It was Judge Carter who had the idea to introduce uh, social psychology theory as part of the Brown case. He was the one that got Kenneth Clark, the great psychologist, right. to use the Dahl study that the U.S. Supreme Court relied on in great part in reaching the Brown decision. And Ted, Judge Carter was proud of what he had done in Brown, but he thought it naive, uninformed. That's how many believe that first Brown decision to have accomplished an effective end to an endemic injustice. Well, everybody felt that Brown was, um, this was the end, that the whole thing was solved. I can't remember what I felt at the time, because I. I was too tired and stuff. <laughs> right after that, I realized something else had to be done. And Brown won was, you know, this great decision and so forth. But then you came to apply it, and then came Brown too. So we're uh, talking about with all deliberate speed, speed yeah. which really meant go as slowly as you'd like. Yeah, yeah. This all deliberate speed business was the first time the Supreme Court has denied any plaintiff is constitutional rights that right from being vindicated immediately. And that was racist. My feeling is, you know, this is this is a racist country. And what you have to do is to go with the punches. And you can't just cry and weep and cover up your hands. What you have to do is just fight on. So, Ted, at the end of his life, we have Judge Carter, who not only had participated in a vital way in Brown, but was continuing to also talk about the shortcomings in enforcement, the continued segregation. Do you think the fact that he remained uh, continually uh, militant about that issue, as opposed to being sort of put on the wall as a statute, is one of the reasons that there hasn't been a lot of attention paid to Judge Carter in terms of his historical role? I'm, I'm, I'm not really sure. I think uh, one of the reasons people... Uh, in recent years, didn't know that much about Judge Carter because he became a U.S. District Judge, and as a judge, he had to take a very kind of backseat position. But Judge Carter, I can tell you, was very concerned about the issue of racism in this country, far beyond uh, the parameters of just education. What Brown really was supposed to be about, it was about integrating America, it was about the dream of equal opportunity, and he believed right up until... Uh, his final days, that that dream uh, uh, still uh, has not been achieved and that we have to continue to fight and fight very hard to deal with the whole history of slavery and race issues in America. And yet I think he, he Nina, was so unique in his candor for someone who sat on the federal bench and was uh, certainly a senior statesman um, to be as blunt as he was and say, it's a racist country. Face it, and, and let's start from there. How, how delightful was it to deal with him um, when he said what he meant? Yeah, but he was also very, very thoughtful about the big picture. And as Ted said, it wasn't just about education. Of course, education, of course, was the key. 
but he really believed that all of society really needed to work to remove all of the obstacles around young people in terms of giving them opportunity. And yes, he really believed that so much of that had to do with racism and white supremacy. And it also had to do with poverty. And he believed that so many people were stuck in poverty because of the lack of opportunity, you know, no jobs. As I said before, his father worked in manufacturing in Newark. For many unskilled laborers today, there are no opportunities. So he really was talking big picture. And he's read a great book, Race Matters. Um, I hope I said that correctly, that that's the correct, um, it was written in 2004. And he really ends the book by saying that we haven't done a good job of really ensuring that we look at every factor and every aspect of people's lives to ensure equal opportunity under the law. And, and as Judge Carter knew, what Brown didn't do, well, that haunted him. He believed there was a bitter irony in the fact that de facto segregation continues to this day in American schools and especially in the North. Brown was supposed to end segregation in the uh, public schools and it, it didn't end segregation at all, particularly in the urban areas in the North where there was concentration. But Brown was the wedge, wasn't it, yeah. by which you could open up mm -hmm. other things. Yeah. And how, how did Brown do, if you look at it as the wedge, to open up this racist society in other ways, this well, segregated society? What Brown did, Brown ended mm -hmm. compulsory segregation, mm -hmm. and yet the issue persisted. The whole thing persisted. And so what you saw was that the country was dedicated to white supremacy. But uh, what I liked about Brown is that Brown produced a, um, a, a sizable middle class, black middle class. Nina, uh, what we've learned about Judge Carter is that he was incisive, layered, and nuanced in his thinking about Brown. And in fact, one of the saving graces that he extracts from the Brown experience was what he calls the black growth of the black middle class. What do you think he meant by that? Well, I, I, well, we know exactly what he meant. He meant that there's so many of us have had the opportunities that I just talked about when we first started, about my sister being a pediatrician, my brother being an orthopedic surgeon. Um, I'm a lawyer. My son's a lawyer. I think that's exactly what he meant, that it opened doors in a way that we never, never envisioned that it would. And uh, we want those doors to stay open, so we need to be vigilant. Uh, all the, the, I think the black middle class has a tremendous responsibility to ensure that we reach back and um, make certain that many, many more um, African Americans and uh, minority students become middle class. On the whole, class, do you think it discharge, middle, does effectively discharge that responsibility of reaching back? Excuse me? On the whole, do you think the black middle class does that, reaching back, to discharge that responsibility? I think we could do a lot more. And, and yet, Ted, there was, um, as I said earlier, a candor about this man. He remained a race man, right, up until the end. And he didn't feel that he had to bite his tongue. And you told me what he shared with you about the point at which he became what he called radicalized. Yes, uh, he told me that when he grew, was growing up in uh, New Jersey, that he had a fairly balanced view uh, about, about issues of race, despite, despite the swimming starring. pool incident. Mm -hmm. He said what really uh, radicalized him was when he joined the military right after the beginning of World War II. He was, in, he was in the Army for four years. He was a lieutenant, and he was stationed in the Deep South. He was first in Georgia, and then he went to Louisiana. And he said that was the first time he experienced a different level of racism, a hardcore uh, level of racism. And he said it changed him. It he changed him in a, in a fundamental point. way. Do you think he felt called at that point to be a, an instrument of change? Yes. Yes, and, and, and he decided, he said, because of his military experiences, he was going to devote his entire life to fighting racism. Well, none of us knew the young Robert Carter, but the old Judge Carter, as we've said, did not mince words. As I saw when I asked him how justice is best achieved. Having been on the federal bench since 72 gives you the ideal perch, I think, from which to 
look at something that we on due process are looking at every week, which is how are we doing? If the goal is justice, how close are we to actually achieving it? I don't believe, for example, if the whole issue of this country would be settled if white people, for example, were in the march in Selma. Not blacks, whites. Racism as a white problem. White people put their bodies in terms of protest. White people are getting out and so they're not. There are few whites. White people are making contributions. But all you have to do is have white people in New York, for example, marching and protesting about uh, uh, segregation, discrimination against black. It's over. You don't expect that to happen. No, I don't expect it to happen. But I'm saying that the issue in this country is not segregation, discrimination, it is white supremacy. Ted, very interesting phenomena. Sandy interviews Judge Carter in the 21st century. Um, I interview my dad on due process in the 21st century. And both of those who were close friends with each other, but veterans of a struggle in the 20th century, continue to say that the remaining challenge for America is challenging white supremacy. Does that surprise you, given your exposure to them and to your own reality? No, no, it does not surprise me. If you look at the history of race in this country, our Constitution uh, was written and founded uh, with an express recognition uh, that Africans would be in the Constitution designated as slaves. Our Constitution, we talk about the greatness of the Declaration of Independence and in our Constitution, but our country was founded uh, again, with an express recognition that slavery would be legal. And we've been, we're going to fight that issue, uh, that American issue uh, of race and integration, I think, for the next hundred years. And, uh, and your analysis, Ted, of where we've come since Brown, um, yes, we've come far, but perhaps not as far as uh, folks in 1954 might have expected. It has been uh, improvement at a glacial pace. Uh, things are better, uh, but there's so much more to be done. And the thing that uh, frightens me the most is a lot of people say, well, now we have an African-American president. The issue of race is behind us. Uh, and that's just a lot of hogwash. You don't buy the post-racial era? Oh, I think it's a joke. And as you talk to people, especially in terms of the experience of the Carter Center, has there been a feeling that at least on that narrow issue of broadening the pantheon so that we can have Thurgood Marshall and Robert Carter, that there's movement in the direction of recognizing among ordinary folks who don't practice law and aren't in this universe that Robert Carter played a critical role? Uh, absolutely. No question about it. And also just about his entire life and the whole struggle and how so many can emulate that. And I think it gives a lot of people optimism and hope. What would Ted, what makes, you, what is it your analysis about why, in effect, we've ever had to make an intellectual choice? That there are two interesting men with a complex dynamic, like Thurgood Marshall and Bob Carter, engaged in common struggle, and yet there only seems to be room in the American culture where we try to recognize people as heroes connected to events for one person at the expense of another. Does that reflect the deeper misunderstanding about black history and about the continued struggle against white supremacy? Yes, well, look, first, I start out that for many years, Thurgood Marshall was not viewed uh, in the general community as a hero, nor was Martin Luther King. It was only in, uh, you know, the last 25 years that both Martin, Dr. Dr. King and Thurgood Marshall had been elevated uh, to a certain stature. But when I was growing up as a young kid, if you talked uh, to people in the white community, they were both viewed uh, sometimes uh, as devils. <laughs> Um, so, so look, things change. I believe over time that Judge Carter uh, will get his uh, just due as historians write more and focus more, not just on Thurgood Marshall, but also on all of the great lawyers involved in the Brown decision. Nina, was he an optimist, Judge Carter? Absolutely. No question about it. Very much of an optimist and a realist. But a realist. And a realist. Very much of a realist. And I think the social um, psychology studies that he did really pointed to the realism and the impact that segregation and discrimination have on a person, the whole person, their, their, psychological, um, uh, their psychological state, 
really, really very, this very This is dependent. sad to say, but that's it for this special edition of Due Process. With our thanks to Nina and Ted Wells, but we hope you'll join us next week and every week for more on the critical issues of law and social justice. Till then, we hope you'll friend us at facebook.com slash TV and watch our programs old and new at youtube.com slash TV. For Sandy and all of us here, I'm Raymond Brown. Thanks for watching. most important court case in America. Well, that's how it happened. Here we are, from a despised group, but out of those people comes the epitome of a judicial decision. <laughs> right after that, I realized something else had to be done. And Brown won was, you know, this great decision and so forth. But then you came to apply it, and then came Brown too. So we're talking uh, about, with all deliberate speed, which really meant go as slowly as you'd like. Yeah, yeah. Nobody knew what that alter deliberate speed meant. Even with, with Brown 2, I realized we weren't going back. And what we m might have to do to win it is just bring another suit and keep on, keep on, keep on. Major funding for due process provided by the New Jersey State Bar Foundation, committed to educating the public about the law, and by the Fund for New Jersey, supporting informed citizens for an effective democracy.